Hello, and thank you very much for linking into this uh, webcast. Um, my name is Manuel Salto Tellez. I'm the Chair of Molecular Pathology and Professor of Pathology in Queen's University, Belfast. And this lecture uh, is trying to analyze the impact that genomic medicine is having in the practice of tissue and cellular pathology and suggesting ways in which perhaps we can considering uh, uh, training uh, the new generation of pathologists. In an uh, um, area that changes substantially in very little time, it may be worth indicating that this is a talk that was given for the first time on the 21st of July 2017 in a workshop organized by CM Path, and we are recording it today on the 8th of August of, of 2017. The CM Path, as a background, is essentially an initiative by the National Cancer Research Institute program in the United Kingdom. It aims to achieve the change that is needed to support academic cellular molecular pathology in the UK and making the results benefiting the diagnostic and the research community at large, both in the UK and globally. What I am presenting today is the analysis of a group of people in the work stream one of CM Path that is dealing with training with a skill and capacity. This is work that I have co-led with Professor Louis Jones, and as you can see, there is a large number of people that have contributed to this reflection. Talking about molecular pathology the genomic impact and the change in training of molecular pathology, I would like to address three questions. Why is it necessary to transform the way we see pathology and train new pathologists? What it is that we need to train the new generation of pathologists? And perhaps some ideas on how we can start thinking on training pathologists differently. Let me start with the why. This is a reflection that goes back a few years that it started 10 years ago in these papers. It was clear that pathology at the beginning, a few centuries ago, was pathology of the dead, which were essentially analyzing autopsies to learn physiopathology and to try to understand how we were linking changes in the dead bodies with the physiopathology and the symptoms that these patients had when they were alive. And it was only probably at the middle of last century that pathology of the dead became the pathology of the living. In the word of somebody, it was like transforming pathology from dead to living. What happened at that time, led by a series of people in different parts of the world, is that pathology became immediately a clinical discipline. So much so that no oncologist, no clinician, no surgeon would decide on a treatment option for the patients or would prognosticate the disease unless there was a full surgical pathology report supporting that evidence. At that point, pathology became not only therefore the main tool for therapeutic decision making, it also became the central life in many academic hospitals at the time. Reality, however, it started to change and it started to be challenged by several people at several levels. Here you have an example of the then director of the National Cancer Institute back in 1999 that challenged the scientific community to essentially lay the ground for changing the basis of tumor classification from morphological to molecular characteristics. As you can imagine, pathologists felt quite threatened at the time. And in fact, this process has transformed medicine. There is no question about that. Personalized medicine, cancer immunotherapy are a product of this new vision of understanding cancer. However, it didn't work quite like this. It didn't change the classification from morphological to molecular. Indeed, what it did was to create extra layers of molecular complexity between the surgical pathology report and the therapeutic decision making. Ten years ago, the single biomarker testing were still a bit modest compared with today, but as you can see, there was already a layer of biomarkers that were important, even more so when we started bringing 